Hello, today we're going to be talking about the type of instrumentation that it takes to measure a UV vis absorbance spectrum. Shown here is a sample spectrum for an analyte that absorbs both in the deep UV range at less than 300 and in the visible range between 500 and 600 nanometers. And we see also that we can tell quantitatively the difference in absorbance as we increase the concentration of, of the analyte uh, as shown here, ranging from five micromolar up to 25 micromolar. And if we have a good quantitative absorbance spectrophotometer, then we would be able to choose one wavelength and quantify the absorbance as it increases in response to increases in the concentration. So in order to get this type of quantitative analytical data, we need a good instrument. Let's look at what the components of that are. Any UV vis instrument is going to have a light source, whether broadband excitation or a single wavelength, a way to select what wavelength is going through. And then once that wavelength goes through to the sample, as shown here in a cuvette, then whatever light is not absorbed will finally reach the detector. Once at the detector, it needs to be converted from photons to electrons so that we can digitally quantify it for a computer. Uh, today, we're going to discuss in detail the types of light sources that are available, the types of sample holders, and the types of detectors. The monochromator was already discussed when we talked about atomic spectroscopy earlier. All right, so as we look at what the options are for light sources for molecular spectroscopy, we think that the ideal type of light source would be one that is bright and uniform across all wavelengths, meaning that it emits at an equal light intensity across all wavelengths in the UV spectrum. It should also be stable over time as opposed to fluctuating. We don't want any of these fluctuating lamps like when you're sitting in a restaurant and the light is buzzing above you. You don't want that when you're trying to make an analytical measurement. You need a nice stable uh, light emission. And we'd also like it to be inexpensive so that we can afford to replace it when it breaks. No one light source meets all of these criteria. And so in reality, we end up having to choose between them um, and, and prioritizing different uh, parts of these ideals, uh, depending on our application. So the most common light source that is used for UV visible spectroscopy is actually a combination of two light sources. Uh, when we want to look in the deep UV less than 300 nanometers, we use a deuterium lamp. And its uh, emission spectrum is shown here, this blue curve in this graph. And you can see that it really only emits at less than about 300 nanometers. Uh, above that, it's really not emit emitting much with the exception of this one peak out here. So the deuterium is really good for deep UV. Above 300 nanometers, we usually rely on what's called a halogen lamp, which is a, a tungsten filament-based lamp. So we're putting a voltage across the tungsten and it's emitting. Um, and that usually emits um, with a spectrum that's shown here representatively in the red. And you can see that it is not uniform across all wavelengths. Um, in fact, we have some a very bright emission here around 650 nanometers, an increasing emission from uh, 400 to 700 nanometers. Um, so, so this doesn't meet our perfect ideal of uniformity, but this is what's most common, uh, and it is sufficient for most UV vis absorbance measurements. There are other types of light sources available. Um, a xenon lamp and mercury lamp both provide emission across the full spectrum of UV to visible range. Um, however, uh, the, the mercury in particular is really nonlinear. It has a lot of spikes uh, that we call emission lines. And these are most commonly used for fluorescent spectroscopy because they are quite bright, even though uh, they are not as uniform. There's also uh, the option to use single wavelength excitation in a UV vis spectrometer. So maybe you don't need to be able to excite across the full wavelength. You really only care about one wavelength. In that case, you could choose an LED light source or a laser that was specifically tuned to the wavelength that you know you care about for your analyte. And then you'll get bright steady emission without having to use a monochromator. So my question to you at this point is, for a generic UV vis spectrophotometer where you don't know yet what analytes you're gonna be putting in it, um, would you rather build it 
using a single wavelength light source like an LED or a laser or a broadband light source like the deuterium halogen lamp that we talked about before or the, say the, the xenon lamp. Which one would you choose? So you can pause the video and think about that for a moment. Okay, and so if we think it through, the answer is that you're probably better off building your generic UV-Vis spectrophotometer with a broadband light source. And that way you can easily switch between samples without having to change your light source because you know you'll be able to excite it no matter where, uh, what, no matter what wavelength it absorbs. Um, and it also enables you to easily collect a whole absorbance spectrum scanning across all the wavelengths of absorbance. Whereas if you just had a laser, you would only be able to excite at that one wavelength instead of being able to collect a whole spectrum. However, by using that broadband light source, we do absolutely need now a tunable monochromator so that we can select what wavelength we're using to excite the sample. All right, so we've talked so far about light sources. Let's move on. Once the light has uh, been emitted by the light source, passed through the monochromator, it now has to pass through the sample. Of course, most of our samples are liquids um, and they can't just float in space. They need to be put into a container. And it turns out that the material we make that container out of can actually matter and affect our measurement. In particular, the most common materials to make um, the what we call the cuvette, which is what holds the sample, the most common cuvette materials are made usually from inexpensive glass, uh, like borofloat or borosilicate glass, um, or from plastic, which is even cheaper, and we can pump out thousands of these. Unfortunately, both glass and plastic absorb enormously in the UV below about 380 or 350 nanometers, depending on the exact formulation of the glass and plastic. And so you cannot measure a deep UV absorbance using regular glass or plastic. If you want to go down and be able to measure in the deep UV, you have to use a much higher quality material, which is fused quartz. And that is optically transparent, meaning it doesn't absorb down to less than 200 nanometers and all the way up to greater to, than 2,500 nanometers or sometimes even greater than 3,000 nanometers, depending on the material. And so uh, if you really need to be able to cover the full spectrum down to deep UV out to the IR, um, then you really have to use a quartz sample holder. All right, so the last piece, detectors. When we think about a detector for a UV vis, it's useful to think first generically. Um, what is it that we're trying to do? And so here, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to convert the, the photons that pass through the sample into electrons so that we can have digital data. Okay, a device that converts incoming light to electrical energy is called a transducer. So I ask you, what are the properties of an ideal transducer? You can pause the video and think about what you might want in terms of sensitivity, cost, speed, things like that. All right, so what we see um, is that we would really like a uh, obviously a high sensitivity. What that means is we wanna be able to detect very small numbers of photons or even a single photon uh, with enough signal to noise that we can tell the, the, that the number of electrons we get for one photon is different from just the background noise produced by the transducer. Um, speaking of noise, we would like it to have zero output in, when we're in the dark. So meaning if there are no photons coming in, we would like zero electrical signal. Now, in reality, that almost never happens. Um, again, as before, we'd like constant response over a wide range of wavelengths, so we really don't want our detector to be dependent on wavelength. We have the monochromator up front to select our wavelength with the light source. We'd like our detector to be able to respond equally to any wavelength coming in. And we would like our electrical current that's coming out to be linear proportionally to the amount of light that's going in. That way it's very simple to quantify, okay, double the current means double the, the, the light power. Now again, in reality, none of these things are possible to have all of them simultaneously. Um, one reason, just one of many, is the fact that all transducers suffer a little bit from what's called dark current which is an electrical response that you get even in the absence of incoming light. Um, and it's often a response to thermal radiation, which is infrared radiation, um, meaning heat. 
So any type of uh, heat emission near the detector can cause an electrical response in the detector that would show up as uh, we would think that it was transmitted light. Many modern detectors, though not all, will automatically correct for this uh, by determining what is the amount of electrical signal that's being detected in the absence of light and then subtracting that out from all of your actual detected light. Okay, so um, let's move on to a specific type of detector. The first one that we're going to talk about too, the first one is called a photodiode. And this is a type of semiconductor, uh, semiconducting material, and it converts incoming photons to electricity. Um, the nice thing about this is it's not wavelength specific, so any wavelength of light that comes in will trigger uh, the same type of electrical response. And it is usually a linear response. So this has the benefit of linearity where one photon coming in will produce one electron going out. Now, modern types of photodiodes, um, including one that's called an avalanche photodiode, can actually be amplified a little bit. Uh, but they don't amplify very high as much as the next type of detector we're going to talk about. And often if you try to amplify them too much, then there's a lot of dark current and noise. These have the benefit of being inexpensive, relatively sensitive, and uh, because they are simple, you can easily pattern them into arrays in order to make um, a detector that has spatial resolution in its detection. All right, the second type of detector that we're going to cover um, is called a photomultiplier tube. And it has a slightly more complex way that it functions. Like the photodiode, the photomultiplier tube is not wavelength specific. So any wavelength of light coming in will trigger a similar electrical response. Unlike the photodiode, the photomultiplier tube amplifies the signal, hence the name multiplier. Uh, in fact, a single photon coming in can trigger one to 10 million electrons going out. So this is enormous amplification. And the level of amplification is quantifiable and we call it the gain. So we'll say I'm operating at high gain or low gain, or you can even give it a number like a gain of a thousand or a gain of two or something. And uh, th what those numbers actually mean depends on the detector in question. Uh, so you can't, it, it's not a direct numerical conversion. All right, these are fast. So an incoming photon, the way that it works is here's the photon in yellow. It comes in and it hits this substance called a photocathode. And this is similar to what we had in the photodiode where once uh, an electron comes in, uh, it is, I'm sorry, once a photon comes in, it produces one electron. So this photocathode has a linear response. So we get one electron from the photon and then it hits this material called a dynode. And the dynode amplifies it. So one electron comes in and you get a few more electrons coming out. And then it hits another dynode and it gets amplified again, even more electrons. And then it hits the next dynode and get even more electrons. And so by the end, after a series of amplifications, we have over a million electrons for the one photon. And you can control the amplification by controlling the voltage across the dynodes. Uh, for this introductory analytical course, we don't need to know the details of this instrument. Other than that, we have um, an incoming photon is linearly converted by a photocathode to one electron, which is then amplified through a series of dynodes. Okay, and then finally, all this current goes out to the computer for detection. Okay, so PMTs, these are the photomultiplier tube, otherwise known as PMT. These are great at amplification of the signal. Now, unfortunately, they also can amplify your stray light and your dark current. Okay, so usually we have to do something to minimize the dark current when using these or else it can overwhelm your system. Knowing what you know about what dark current is, maybe look back at your notes to see what causes it. I would like you to think what, what could you do to minimize the amount of dark current in the system? So look back at how dark current works and then think what could you do to minimize it? Okay, I'm gonna assume that you pause the video to think about that. And the simple answer is that we often physically cool EMT. So since dark current is a response often to thermal radiation, by keeping the PMT cold, we can really make a big difference. Um, and so you'll often hear, hear something called a cooled PMT and it's 
um, cooled either by chilled water or by an onboard refrigeration system. Um, and we often are trying to get it down to below freezing, quite, a, quite cold. Okay, so um, this is really the end of what we needed to cover. As a summary today, we covered all of um, the parts of a UV vis instrument from the light source um, and the sample holder and the detector. And for more information on monochromators, you can go look at the video on atomic absorption. Thank you.